Hi, I'm Jason Klug, founder and CEO of Klugonics Group. We're a full-service product development and manufacturing agency, and we help many brands in many different industries in the consumer product space design, engineer, prototype, and then onboard and manage manufacturing sourcing uh, internationally. We want to talk today about the factories that you're currently working with and how to know if they're actually the right factory and if they're doing what you need and how you need them to do it. This is Hunter. Hunter is the VP of sales over at Klugonics. You'll probably see him moseying around the trade show floor. We go every year to the, tra- the, the New York Toy Fair. We've been there for now seven years. It's our favorite trade show out of all the trade shows we go to. So he's become quite the expert because of all of the conversations that he has with all different types of companies. And when companies come to us, a lot of times they come to us when they have a new idea that they want to design, engineer, prototype, and manufacture, or they have issues with their existing supply chain and they need us to help them figure out what's going on and fix it. So with that, we've learned a lot and heard a lot of case studies about things that have gone wrong wrong for various businesses. So let's talk through the uh, location of the factory. Well, I mean, usually what happens is you find a main factory. You find a... Yeah. That's like your main... The mother factory? Sure. (laughs) That main factory is going to have the ability to make the bulk of the parts and then do the assembly and kitting process where they're putting the package or the product together fully. So it's a fully packaged good. And then usually when it comes to other auxiliary items, like things that are made out of different materials or different processes, they're going to find nearby factories themselves. And they'll probably work with like a friend of theirs or a a friend factory. Right. Right. I, I think it's important to figure out who that friend factory is. And ideally, if you can control who is supplying those other parts on your end, so that way, you know, issues don't pop up with something that is through another layer that you cannot control. Um, That's harder to do. uh, But I think if you go in at the beginning with that in mind and find those resources yourself, which we help do, you can eliminate that problem before it becomes one. Right. So then talk through, I guess, on your experience, like also different areas of China specialize yeah. in different things, right? So it's like Southern China, mm-hmm. they do a lot of electronics, right? And so, you know, you get a mm-hmm. lot of like good pricings maybe on plastics, but then like if you go more north, you mm-hmm. know, typically, you know, maybe metal fabrications here. What's your experience there? Usually people make the mistake of focusing in the wrong area and the pricing is usually ends up being higher, for mm-hmm. example. So I know like a lot of toys, especially injection molded toys and stuff like that, you see a lot of suppliers that are up in the Ningbo area. Uh, So, you know, that's extremely common. They ship out of like Shanghai, that port. Um, But down in Dongguan and Shenzhen and that type of area, there's so many factories and there's so many different capabilities and it's pretty blended. And yeah, there's a lot of electronics and whatnot, especially like in Dongguan where like, way you know huawei is for example the phone manufacturer so there's a lot of like you know similar types of production facilities but you can find anything there but a lot of times what ends up happening is you hit a ceiling where one your pricing's not very competitive or two you have a hard time finding someone that specializes in making something that's more unique and for example Uh, I'm working on a project to make a dish rack and it uses uh, wire bending techniques and tube bending techniques. And we've looked all over, you know, Guangzhou and that whole Southern area and have found suppliers that are capable, but the pricing was 20 to 30% higher what we were seeing when we went up to the Zhejiang province up North. And, you know, what we realized is that pocket surrounding it was mostly, you know, metal fabrication, bending, uh, extrusion, uh, wire bending, stuff like that. And we ended up finding a factory that was much more capable, but also able to achieve a better price point and had a larger variety of material options. And it's just because of the region and what is surrounding them. So I do think a lot of times it's worth understanding what you're making 
and the processes involved and then figuring out what area you should be sourcing that from to make sure you're sourcing from the right region. Yeah. Well, I think that moves to like the next point of like shopping around, like the importance mm-hmm. of looking at multiple factories, mm-hmm. right? Like I know that when, at least when we're working with, you know, some of our clients, it's, we're probably quoting four five, six different factories. Sometimes we even reach out to more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we're able to kind of pit them against each other as far as like determining if they're good. Like, yes, their pricing might be competitive, but you know, are they going to be scalable? Like, so there's, there's that importance of shopping around, looking at multiple resources, maybe especially if you're just trying to find a factory on Alibaba, like yeah. their pricing can be very skewed. So make sure you get quotes from a variety of different factories. Well, good. it's good too, because then you can learn a lot by comparing different suppliers' quotes. Like if you see one factory's part price for a specific item is way higher than the other, it's going to force you to ask questions to why and figure out like, well, what's going on there? You know, yeah. like why is that price so much higher? Or let's say the you're making a plastic product and all the plastic parts are dramatically higher at one supplier, but everything else is much lower and it turns out that you're actually dealing with a trading company that is middlemanning the plastic parts and then they're only really focused on the metal parts and they're just putting up a right. front to get that type of business. It's always hard on Alibaba to to, to not get a trading company. Yeah. And that's always a, a mistake that people make. They'll say they're a factory all day, but you really don't know until you walk, you know, until you travel to China and show up on their doorstep and see that they have on the side of their building the brand that they put themselves out there as, yeah. or the the you know the company that they put themselves out there as, and that's a common thing that we have to deal with where we are vetting out factories and we're you know finding things or where someone sends us a referral through Alibaba and then the majority of the time it ends up being someone completely different, yeah. And then we go and physically tour the factory and learn that it was not the case. Well, yeah, and I, I think that we've had so many people come to us. Where they're like, yeah, um, I was working through this project. I was working with this factory. You know, I paid them for tooling. I got my first production run and the production run wasn't done right. And then I tried to reach out for like help mm-hmm. or for them to fix it. And then they go completely dark. Yeah. I think that's because there you have that middleman that's fronting as a factory. Mm-hmm. And then if something goes wrong, you know, mm-hmm. he can disappear and there's nothing really that you can do about it, right. um, you know, in that situation, which, which can be tough. Yeah. And that's actually, uh, more common than you think where they disappear. So should we talk about too, like the size of factory, right? Like, cause I think that goes into like scalability is like some smaller factories have, there's benefits to going with smaller factories, benefits Mm -hmm. to going to larger factory. Yeah. I guess like a new, a new company. I always opt out of doing like really small factories because usually their systems and processes are not ideal. They likely don't have the right resources for quality inspections and stuff like that. They're probably not as well organized when it comes to just the flow of their factory, which makes it inefficient. They don't have the capital or income to back themselves if they screw up on something and they won't be willing as willing to fix it. I think, you know, an entry level brand should start more with like a medium to small size factory. And the reason for that is I, I think is better because it's small enough that you have enough sway where they're going to pay enough attention to you because you're, you know, even though you're a startup client, there can be enough volume to gauge their interest, yeah. you know, but also being a medium sized factory and you start to get decent order quantities, they can sustain a decent order quantity until you're able to transition to a new supplier mm-hmm. and you're not rushed to do it. Uh, I think to the point when you get to, a medium, large, or a large size factory, you have to be pushing good numbers in yeah. order to get the attention that you need, or they'll, you know, they're going to prioritize their bigger clients over you. And their bigger clients might be, you know, pushing quarter million units per month. And, you know, if you're doing 10, 20, 30,000 units per month, even that won't get their attention at that point, which can yeah. be difficult. Asking like factory size, number of machinery, or like the okay. number of, of machines they have, like if it's an injection only facility. How would you find like, for instance, like between like a small versus like a large factory, like employee size, like amount number of employees? Like mm. what, would, what do you think that would look like? I mean, I feel like a small factory is like somewhere under 30 employees. A medium factory could be like, 30 to like 150 employees. 
And then, I mean, large factories can be 150 and beyond. Right, with a lot of um, facilities. Yeah. yeah. And it also depends on like the number of capabilities and all that type of stuff too. Like usually they're pretty specialized. Like the silicone factories, a lot of them we work with are, you know, medium, kind of like right in the medium, medium size in the middle there. And, you know, they're, they're good to the point where you could do, you know, 20, 30,000 units per month, no problem while you find right. a factory that can do, you know, a quarter million units per month. Um, and usually medium factories have like decent systems and processes. They're clean, you know, and these are all things that you want to look for when you're inspecting them. Um, and just making sure that like, you know, they're going to do a good job. They have enough cash flow. You can see like the number of projects they're manufacturing right. at the time. You can see how busy their floor is and how much their machines are currently working if they're under or over capacity. You know, those are all things that you can look for to not only, you know, they might be a medium factory that's struggling and be running like a small factory. Yeah. And that could well, be I feel like we heard a lot about like, once again, a lot during COVID where it was like people's factories went out of business, right? And then they were right. just forced to move to different locations because they were a small factory. Mm -hmm. They hadn't been around that long or they were like, you know, working on very small margins. So that mm -hmm. factory went out of business. They couldn't get their tooling. Mm -hmm. They couldn't move. And so, yeah, I think sizing definitely takes an impact there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so we talk about working environments. Yeah. Yeah. So in your, in your time that you've probably visited China, obviously we've done several factory audits. We have our team go into factories personally. Um, what are some of the things that, you know, you've seen that like, for instance, working environments, you know, like what are some of the things that we try to look out for there? I mean, you can tell like when you walk around it, just like the temperature, you know, yeah. <laughs> you can, you can make sure it's good. <laughs> like just looking at the health of the people working the machinery, I like to check out like ventilation and stuff, you know, that's always important, especially like an injection and silicone. You want to make sure that they've got, you know, fans blowing stuff out the door and whatnot and keeping the air refreshed and clean. One of the biggest thing I always check out is the cleanliness of the floor. That right. shows a lot. I like to check out where they're like eating lunch in their living conditions, mm -hmm. you know, especially if they're serving lunch, which a lot of the medium, large, large factories have food courts and whatnot. And you can kind of check out and see like what they're serving up. And like, that's, that'll show a good bit about how they take care of their factory workers. Right. Do some of the factories even like provide housing for oh, employees? Yeah. The living conditions, like you'll see yeah. the, especially like medium to me or like large factories, they'll have, a lot, they'll have full apartment setups on yeah. site. And, you know, oh. you can tell if they're in good shape. And I like to kind of glance in them and see if they're decent living conditions. And a lot of times they are. And then if they're not, then you can start to pay more attention to the actual workers themselves and see if they're healthy and they look like they're taken good care of. Because uh, that'll determine if we use a factory or not, if the people are not taking good care of themselves. Right. So... Okay. And you don't know that, you know, unless you go there and physically walk around and look for those things. And a lot of companies or a lot of people don't pay attention to that. And I think it's an important thing to pay attention to. Right. So like when you go through, for instance, when the factory's going through and doing a production run on a product, right? Mm -hmm. Like we always talk about, you know, typically factories try to cycle through employees, you know, obviously mm -hmm. to make sure that their employees aren't burned out. Do you see that like it's just mostly quality errors that happen? Like do smaller factories because they have so many limited employees on a production line that they do tend to burn out their employees because, mm -hmm. you know, when they go through production or... Usually you could figure that out based on how they're like working hours are because a lot of times if they do two or three shifts okay you can just kind of get an idea of how many sh like how long is a shift for each individual person right. yeah it's hard to know that unless you sit there and watch like a week's worth of shifts yeah. you yeah. know it's really impossible to do that but it's something that we'll ask is like explain and help me understand your shifts and how you break up the the employees um working hours okay yeah yeah, maybe we talk through like, you know, like internal QC Tooling? departments or. Well, I don't trust internal QC departments, really. I, right. I, I mean, it's good that they have them, but. It's just it's know, like a, a point that they address, but it's not yeah. necessarily good that they you, do the you QC. Wanna, you can't trust their QC. The, the good part about having it's a QC objective. department in-house is that they're going to set up systems and processes that involve checks. Right. But 
you know, at the end of the day, bringing in a third party QC is always a good idea, which is what we help with because, you know, they're going to have a different opinion right. than it's what It's their money on the line, right? Like right. if they go th- through and mess up on 30,000 yeah. units, they might not want to check that. But it <laughs> so. is valuable to walk through and see on the lines. Like they'll have people, you know, one person at the end of a line after an assembly where they're doing some kind of test or check and you'll see them running through it to make sure that it's consistent. So a QC department will help in making sure that what those checks are and where they're happening and that they're happening. Yeah, the but at the right end of the mindset. day, you still yeah. want to pull and do full QC inspections on the floor when the run's completed. Especially when you're in injection and silicone molding, I think it's extremely important to have a factory that has an in-house tooling department where they're cutting and making the injection molds or the silicone compression molds or the LSR molds or whatever type of tooling it is. One, they have the ability to quickly iterate and modify and you know work through those revisions as you go through the sampling process that speeds that up. Two, it gives them the ability to maintain the tool well for a long period of time. And, you know, I always think like as a product is being made, the first run might not be perfect, but that in between runs, you have the opportunity to tweak things and having that in-house tooling department makes that process much quicker. And then also the tooling is usually less expensive because the tooling shop would makes money on tools, not on the production run. So if the factory is making money on the production run, they're obviously going to give you a better price on the tool itself because they don't need to monetize or they get to monetize both. Um, so when, so like for instance, when they're saying, when you say that they have internal tooling, right, mm-hmm. and that it's you know they're able to take care of the tool, mm-hmm. you know, what do you think is like the percentage of like how much, how many more units you feel like they can get out of a, a mold? Like, mm-hmm. is there like do you know. get like another like ten percent life oh, on a tool? That. On I a tool, twenty percent. I think if it's well maintained and oiled and stored and. You know, they can resurface textures and stuff because a lot of times tools wear out when like the textures wear down and they can retexturize right. it and stuff like that. So, I mean, it could double the life of a tool if the wear and tear is something that they can fix much quicker in house. Right. You know, and then like the seals of the tools, when tools start to wear down, they get little flashing marks on the seam where the plastic seeps through the gap, you know, the two tooling pieces, for example, two metal pieces, being able to resurface the tool and get it so that, that, that seal is tight again, Right. you know? And those are problems that like in a normal situation, if the Mm -hmm. factory doesn't have tooling in house that you wouldn't find out probably until you, Mm -hmm. you know, cycled through some units and found errors in it. Right. And also it's like, whenever you burn through a tool, I mean, that means your product is successful because you've made hundreds of thousands of units. Yeah. But a lot of times you have a relationship with the factory at that point where they're a lot of times they're happy to make your next tool for free. And I always like to push for that. And that's also a benefit of having that in-house versus if they have an out-of-house tool shop, then they're going to have to pay for it. And they're less likely to be willing to front that capital. Do you feel like tooling in house of the factory also goes back to like factory size? Like, do a lot of smaller factories have tooling in house, um, or is it more something that larger factories or medium sized factories? I would say have? it's like mostly medium and in, in large factories, but I've also seen factories that maybe have like 50, 60 people, and then they have, you know, a CNC and an EDM machine. Like, they have enough to make a tool, right. and they have a small tooling department. But yeah, it's you, small factories are way less likely to have that in-house. Gotcha. Yeah, because you need the engineer, you need the uh, the machinery, you need the uh, in multiple machines. It's not just a CNC machine. You need the finishing tools. You need the ability to cut the detailed parts, like all that stuff. Right. Well, I know too. One thing, like at least when we're doing these audits with these factories, when we're checking the factories, when we do look at their internal tooling capabilities, right? Like we're also looking to see, like, do they take maintenance records of the tool to like mm-hmm. make sure that mm-hmm. you know they're they're they are being taken care of right yeah. versus just going off a of word of mouth that it's yeah. actually happening so it's definitely worth paying attention to and asking for those which we have many times yeah certifications so yeah t- let's talk a little bit about you know different types of certifications mm-hmm. that the factory can have and then maybe mm-hmm. some of the certifications that you might have to get independent of a factory 
I mean, factories always have like a wall plastered with certification. Some of them are completely unnecessary, oh, yeah, but okay. they make them look yeah. better than they are. Or some of them might be, might not be real. They might be yeah. from another factory, right? Yeah. Or like Walmart supplier ID, one factory might yeah. say that they have it, but it could or have they, just been it's expired, from another factory. You know, that's another thing too, yeah. or they have a new location and they haven't redone it at that location. But you also have to know like too, on the, the brand side of things, well, when you, when you get the proof of certifications, looking at the dates and seeing if you could actually look up and see if the certification certification is still legitimate. That's important. But I would say if you're a brand that is planning on going the route of mass retail, I would, from the beginning, make sure that you're choosing a factory that has active audits from those those companies like Walmart or Target or whatnot yeah. um, before you choose. And, you know, just make that something up front that makes you decide if you're going to move forward with them or not. Right. Because, I mean, even with the factory too, to like get Target certification, right, that can take like months. So it's yeah. better to just find a factory if you already have those plans, if yeah. you have a factory that already has it implemented. Right. Um, obviously, experience and reputation, looking and seeing how long they've been around, that's important. Uh, if you can see what other brands they work with, that's also important. I like to see, especially touring showrooms and stuff, Ideally, they're not showing a bunch of other clients' branded stuff as their own. So that's one thing you can see when you're touring a showroom. Sometimes that could be like a bad business practice. You know, that's not theirs. You know, and, But a lot of times they have their OEM products and stuff that you can see as examples, which a lot of times is fine. You know, if they're, you know, because they could sell those products all over the world and whatnot. So as long as they're not directly competing with you or, you know, taking advantage of situations, you, you can kind of figure that out by touring the showroom and making sure that they have good ethics. Uh, when yeah, it comes I, know, I know that's something we looked at too when we're looking at factories outside of China as well because uh-huh. I know like a lot of those factories are newer, yeah, right? And so that they're owned by, you know, a factory in China, but the factory owner opened something up in Vietnam. And so mm-hmm. we're trying to look at, once again, how long they've been around, what's the reputation mm-hmm. of their factory in China before we, you know, put any kind of financial commitment yeah, to it. Go, go get to the core of their uh, their experience from their existing supply or factory setup. And then warehousing, when touring the facility, we just like to look at and see how everything's laid out and what type of space they have. Because sometimes if they do have warehousing, you could take advantage of that where you can import partial portions of runs and they, yeah. they're willing to store it. And it's going to be cheaper to store it there than it would be for example, in the U.S., if you need something to sit for a few months, right? Um, but you could, same time, you can take advantage of a, a larger order quantity and material purchase, so you can bring your costs lower and right. hit a higher order quantity. I mean, those are all things to pay attention to because if they do have that and you can leverage it, you can save money here and there. Um, that does add up. Okay, so some of the questions to look into or think about when you're digging into finding a new factory. I like to see if the factory has its own sales or selling their own products or their own brands. That could be a red flag, in my opinion, you know, looking and seeing if they're doing products and selling directly to Amazon. You don't want to bring something innovative to them and all of a sudden they do something very similar to it and then you're seeing it in the same channels you're selling through. Well, they could do it so quickly if they already have sales channels up. It's like, you know, they could, you know, yeah, copy it or... Yeah, so sell it's, pretty quickly. it's definitely like after you find the factory, you do the tours, you look and see what products are currently on their lines, you look in their showrooms. Like once you see all that stuff and and you know have an idea of what product categories they're mostly focused in, it is worth it to go on, you know, on Amazon and go on online and try to find and see if you can see those products and how successful they've been, or even if they're, you know, unless they're producing it and selling it to another brand and selling on Amazon, obviously that's fine. But just making sure that they're not trying to be their own brand that would directly compete with you. So it's definitely something we like to look for and be cautious of. The thing is like, yeah, signing NDAs. Oh yeah, we always try to push a a non-disclosure, even though in China, for example, the you know, non-disclosures and contracts can be, it could be the Wild West there, but there's still enough impact of having a contract signed with a Chinese factory. They they will take it more seriously if you put the effort in and have them sign a non-disclosure. Well, I think too, like even in our situation, because we have a Chinese filed entity over there, I think mm-hmm. like the NDAs hold a little bit more, 
You yeah, know, it's a Chinese to Chinese entity. Yeah, a little bit more, which helps. I think it's worth asking them to stick their neck out about quality assurance. You know, if they are willing to put their word on a product, and that if there is an issue of a certain percentage that they're willing to compensate you for it, it's better to understand that up front to make sure that they just believe in themselves and their ability to execute the product well. So I think it's worth asking them what kind of warranties or what kind of guarantees they can give you, especially if they're, you know, they have a mistake that's over 5% of your run, for example, they should honor that. This is a tough one to do, but making sure that you're talking to the actual factory employee and not a third party person, you know, that's difficult because with all the trading companies and, you know, what people do on Alibaba, I mean, most of the time it's someone sitting in a small room in Hong Kong and they are working with multiple factories and you don't know who they're working with. It's really important to make sure that you can get through to that and then get directly to the supplier themselves. So it takes some digging or, for example... In-person visits, right? Yeah, you have in-person to go there visits, you know. Or have or, somebody check for you. Yeah, like our company, for example, goes in and we'll figure that out and make sure that it's not a trading company and you're working directly with a supplier. That being said, Klugonix, K-L-U-G-O-N-Y-X, reach out to us on our website. And we've helped develop and manufacture hundreds and hundreds of successful products uh, where we go from industrial design through engineering, prototyping, and help find these factories, do these audits, or work with existing suppliers that we've already built long-term relationships with uh, that we know and trust and they know and trust us. Uh, We can help you build your product from the ground up and help successfully manage your production runs consistently, run after run, to make sure that you continuously get the quality of product that you've wanted since the beginning. We love working with toys. You know, yeah, the, the toy industry's fun. Yeah, the toy industry to us is definitely the best and most fun. It's a fast moving industry. You have to continuously put out new products to stay relevant in the industry to the buyers and the distributors. And I mean, if you're in a bad mood selling toys, then you're going to be in a bad mood in any industry and maybe yeah. you should just retire. <laughs> yeah, check us out, klugonics.com. And thanks for watching and hopefully this is valuable.